when we first created the design renders, and they were just digital design renders on the computer, we sent that to a few automotive press people. And they loved it. They published it, and it actually made it on the homepage of Yahoo.com, which was, you know, back in 2014. And right away, we got calls. We got an order. Somebody right away put down a deposit to buy it. So now I was like, wow. Okay, now we've got to make it. <laughs> you know. Before any world-changing innovation, there was a moment, an event, a realization that sparked the idea. Before It Happened is a show about that idea. Each week, we take a deep dive into a singular light bulb moment that inspired the visionaries to push forward and change our lives. I'm your host, Donna Laughlin. Nearly 20 years ago, I launched a public relations firm with the sole purpose of helping visionaries tell their stories to the world. Now, two decades later, I want to share those stories and more with you. This podcast takes you on a journey before it happened with the innovators, who imagine and are still imagining the future. Ever since I was a child, I was curious about so many things. I spent hours in the garage at science fairs, sifting through popular science, popular mechanics, and pretty much any journal I could get my hands on, exploring and discovering how things work. From transportation and AI to just about anything you can put in your home, office, or pocket. On this show, you'll hear from the innovators themselves as they tell their stories of how they brought those visions to life. Grab your passport and let's go on a journey together. In 2013, Ferris Rezvani had a steady, well-paying IT management job with IBM. Over more than a decade, he had steadily climbed the corporate ladder over several systems engineering roles and finally had a position that promised some longevity. So what did Ferris do? He quit. Obviously, there's more to this story. The reason Ferris left his day job is the reason he's my guest today. Systems engineering and corporate IT jobs had been good to him for years, but he couldn't ignore the nagging fear that he had missed his true calling. Ferris loved cars. He had been obsessed with them since childhood. So you might be thinking he ditched his job at IBM and went to work for Ford or General Motors or even Tesla. Nope, he was thinking bigger. Ferris wanted to design, build, and market his own luxury vehicle. And today he's the CEO of Resvani Motors, maker of the beast sports car and tank SUV, automotive lines that have become must-haves for the rich and famous. Ferris's story actually begins in Iran, where his father served in the Air Force under the Shah regime. For much of his childhood, Ferris followed his family to and from Texas, where the Iranian Air Force would often train. As a young boy, he was captivated by the sleekness and the speed of the fighter jets his father flew. I remember sitting in the planes, you know, looking at the planes from the outside. And I think that really fascinated me. Just the look of the planes were so massive and impressive and powerful. And all of the cockpit instrument clusters as a kid, you know, I was just like, wow, this is amazing. What do all these things do? So it was just very, very fascinating and inspiring for me to to find more. I'm sure they told you, don't touch that button. (laughs) (laughs) So did your father fly for fun in addition to as a military career? Yeah, after he retired, he does fly still. He flies twin-engine Cessna and helicopters and with his friends as well, yeah. And what about you? Did you go on his fly with him on a private side? I did, yeah. I do fly sometimes uh, on the private side with him. Do you have your certificate? Uh, no, I don't officially. So I just never got around to getting it. And, and like I said, my eyesight and other things like that. So I just uh, sit in the co-pilot seat. You can never just sit in the co-pilot seat. <laughs> <laughs> it's too much fun to fly. Yeah. So were you at all curious? So you're growing back and forth at Tehran and then the United States. So where was home like when you were growing up? Were you in the U.S.? Yeah. So as you can imagine, with a military career, there's a lot of traveling involved. But but yeah, I was in the States for maybe a year at a time and so forth. But when I was growing up, it was Tehran. Yeah, in Iran, it was my hometown and, you know, home. So how old were you when you moved here permanently? I was nine, nine years old. So you're at school in the U.S., a very different culture. What was it like growing up, you know, with a beautiful, deep culture and then moving to the United States? I mean, it must have been a little bit of culture shock, too. 
Yeah, absolutely. You know, I always saw, of course, American, you know, TV shows and Hollywood, kind of what you, the image most of the world sees about the U.S. is through Hollywood, right? So I remember seeing all the, all the movies and, and all the cool things and Disneyland and everything else. So coming here was definitely a, you know, uh, a treat. I was very happy to be in the States. So were you enamored with cars at that young age? Oh, absolutely. I, I used to, you know, stick out the window. My parents said when I was four or five years, I would name all the cars, talk about the cars. So I had my head out the window the whole time as a kid. I was curious, when you were little, did you have Hot Wheels or Matchboxes? Oh, absolutely. I used to. I had little toy cars and I used to play on our family room rug had these designs on it. And uh, I used to, uh, you know, make believe that those were little roads. And so I would ride the little Hot Wheels cars on those roads and, and imagine. So I had a whole collection of cars. Yeah. <laughs> At what age did you start driving? Uh, I think it was 15 and a half when I got a uh, permit here in the States, so California. What was your first car? <laughs> my first car was a Honda CRX, 1991 Honda CRX, which was the, the cool car, you know, back then to have. Your cars are light years from that. <laughs> I can imagine the obsession. So you get your first car. Did, was it any way or shape, you know, the experience that you had sitting behind the uh, the Air Force plane cockpit? I can't imagine having the same. Yeah, well, that was a kind of my inspiration was military type equipment, aircraft, uh, you know, armored vehicles, ships. I was fascinated by all that stuff just because of, you know, the looks and the capabilities and everything. And I think it's one of those things where it allows you to be, it's kind of like the Iron Man suit, you know, it, it, it allows you to be, to have powers beyond a mortal human you know, to be able to travel at that type of speed. Well, when you're looking at all the steam dials too, right? That to me, I just always excited. It's like popular mechanics, popular science, right? And you're looking at all the steam dials and it's like, I always want like, what does this one do? What does that do? Was that your fascination as a kid as well? Yeah, absolutely. I think my fascination was really the look and the design and the coolness of all the, you know, fighter planes and then the mechanical aspects of them as well. So I enjoyed both. So you get out of high school, you go to college. Tell me about what you studied and what your favorite subject was. So, you know, I studied computer science and I, you know, I think my favorite subjects were probably history or things like that. But I love computer science because of the mechanical aspects of things and kind of, um, you know, making things work. And why didn't you pursue industrial design and automotive design? Well, I think, you know, growing up, I viewed it as really not something that you can make money on. So, you know, my maybe a little bit influenced from my parents at the time when I was a kid of going into a field that could make money and could have jobs available. So the design imagineer job was just maybe a little too, too much of a fantasy. Yeah, probably. Yeah. Yeah. I get accused of that too. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> so you're in college, you're studying mechanical engineering. You get out of school. What's your first job? So my first job was at an internet service provider. This was in the year 2000, roughly when the dot-com was happening. So, you know, companies were offering ridiculous salaries right out of school. So, yeah, I worked for an ISP and uh, supported a lot of clients and really loved it. Loved designing, you know, network infrastructures, overall technologists, you know, managing firewalls, routers, programming, you know, just, just a lot of different things. So you were designing, though. So that was that the first kind of part of, like, you would actually say that you had, like, an element of design, building this architecture? Yeah, absolutely. So, so designing data centers, for example, or things like that. It's not so much as much visual aesthetics as it was more uh, functional and seeing projects from beginning to end. And I think, you know, being in a corporate environment, you really kind of understand that you start learning the process of product development, you know, going from beginning to end of a project or a product. So as a mechanical engineer, how many jobs did you have before you decided like to leap out and create what ultimately became Rizvani? Yeah. So after that, I worked for IBM Global Services. It was a remote kind of location job. I, I was with them for about seven years. And that allowed me to then I started essentially learning how car design is done. Car design and designers are typically very hidden by car companies. It's their secret sauce. You know, they often design in solitude and they're never recognized for their designs typically, you know, in the beginnings. Uh, so it, it's kind of a very closed environment. They don't want the how-tos to get out. There's a barriers to entry. So I set out to really learn how it's done. And I contacted various companies and started learning on my own how it's done while I was still you know, employed with IBM and started going on a devil track with that. So you're schooling yourself. I was schooling myself. Yeah, I was teaching myself, schooling myself. So I started that in 2014. 
I started the concepts for the first sports car, which was the Beast. So mechanical drawings and sketching and all that you did on your own or did you? No, that's something I tried, but sketching wasn't my, uh, you know, my, my nature. I understood what a cool design looked like, but I didn't really know how to do it. So I did look for professional car designers or designers that are still coming fresh out of school. So I put out ads, you know, in some of the freelancing sites and so forth, you know, looking for professional car designers. And so they sent me all their portfolios. I looked at portfolios and then, you know, I selected one that I really connected with and I uh, connected with them and we started the design together with multiple different versions and and under my design direction, we developed on the beast. And is that your designer that came from Lamborghini and Ferrari? Correct. Yeah. Is he still with you? Yes. So tell me, just take me that moment where you just said you're self-schooling, you're looking at all the options in the market and you had an idea in your your head of what your ideal car is. Like, was it a accumulation of different things you've seen or did you just going all the way back to a child have this visual of like the future car? Can you describe that? Yeah, it was basically what the feeling of the car, what it gave you and that was kind of the design inspiration, but really a, a sports car, you know, the design was a sports car that would have, you know, no design limitations, you know, wanted to have as much freedom of design as possible on the platform at the right proportions. Do you have the early day sketches of what you had intended? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, I do. Absolutely. Absolutely. We started off with some pretty funny looking ones that just, would, you know, I would probably laugh at now. And then as it evolved, evolved into something, you know, really cool and well-proportioned and you know, professionally designed. What was the funniest thing that you thought of that you didn't take to market? <laughs> uh, I think it was an open wheel car, kind of like the the Formula One cars, you know, where the wheels are open and, you know, the racers like that and that, those types of things. So were you still at IBM when you started working with your designer to create ultimately the beast? Yeah, I did. You know, I was very, I was a little bit hesitant, you know, I, I didn't want to completely quit my, you know, job, a good paying job to start something that is completely new to me. So I did do it in parallel. While I was working at IBM, I started the, you know, Resvani Motors, developed the concepts for it. So you had the designer. What about the engineering team? How did you assemble that? So the engineering team, I consulted with various engineering companies that had some experience with this. The pricing they wanted, of course, was absolutely outrageous. I couldn't afford it at the time. So that's when I decided to build on a production platform where, you know, rather than building from the ground up, which would require probably, you know, 40, 50 million dollars initial just to start building on a production platform that's already proven, parts are, it's engineered, parts are available. So I, I started to approach it that way. And that's kind of the old school of coach building. And that's how cars were built back in the day. You know, Maybach, for example, the Mercedes Maybach was a coach builder. They used to take Mercedes, remove the body, put a more designer body or designer suit, if you will, over it. So it was really that approach that allowed us to allow me to really save money, time, engineering efforts, engineering costs, rather than, you know, not reinventing the wheel, if you will. Like imagine, so you're working all day long and then you're creating this dream team to bring this car together. How did you keep it stealth? Yeah. So, you know, I involved everyone with sort of a piece of the effort and, I was excited about it. I believed in it. I loved it. And, and that translated. So you have your first concept. All You have your engineering team and you have your design team and you're ready to go. Did you use 001 in the first car or did you actually have a buyer in mind already for the first car? So when we first created the design renders and they were just digital design renders on the computer, we sent that to a few automotive press people. And they loved it. They published it. And it actually made it on the homepage of yahoo.com, which was, you know, back in 2014. And right away, we got calls, we got an order, somebody right away put down a deposit to buy it. So now I was like, wow, okay, now we've got to make it, (laughs) you know. And so then I went to, you know, some friends and family and raised some money as well, but also, you know, used the deposit essentially for the R&D to produce the car. That was going to be a question. So was, <laughs> where did you get the, the funding while you're working your day job? Did you do like a network of angel investors? Yeah, it was mostly friends and family to start with. Obviously going to investors and saying, you know, hey, I have no automotive background, no experience, and I want to start a car company. You know, <laughs> it's, uh, I think it's going to be a little tough. So, you know, having one order in hand, having a great design, and the people who knew me, you know, was enough to, you know, get the company jump started. At that point where you're already using your 
family legacy of like since you were a child and fascination with planes? Was that already part of your story that you were telling? Yeah, absolutely. And like I said, you know, my fascination and appreciation and really love of cars began with the aviation side because of the how cool the airplanes looked, you know, the fighter planes and some of the military, how cool they looked. That really jump-started my fascination with designs and how designs make you feel. And that became the cornerstone of our company in terms of the design aspect of it. So let's talk about that a little more, the user experience and how important that is. What does it feel like for you when you sit behind one of your cars now? Well, you know, when I sit behind... There's a part of me that's always trying to improve, always looking in the future, always looking ahead. So I rarely ever enjoy, you know, the moment. I'm always in the future, if you will. (laughs) So I'm always looking at improvements, you know, features, new features. What's the next model? But when I sit in, you know, in one of our cars and I drive it, it gives me that that feeling of the visceral driving experience. That you know, the shakes, the 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 feeling, the sound, the the design, the uniqueness of it. You know, it all embodies a cool experience. So the very, very first model that you had, the prototype, was that experience exactly the same excitement and thrill that you have today when you sit in the next generation model? It's definitely improved. It's definitely become, you know, a little bit more consumer friendly and comfortable, if you will. You know, so the market has definitely defined a little bit of that. Whereas the original beast, you know, was very visceral. Your clothes would smell like gasoline fumes when you got out sometimes. It's like a Formula One driver. (laughs) Yes, exactly. So if BMW is the ultimate driving machine and Tesla is the ultimate green machine, then what is Rezvani? You know, I I would say Rezvani is the design experience or the feeling of excitement when you just look at it. And I think that's a great catchphrase that we could come up with. But really, that that's really it, is is the design that really, uh, you know, is the cornerstone of our company. I read somewhere that you're creating fantasies for people who want to drive a specific car. So is the goal, is this kind of like that same feeling that you had when you were conceptualizing your dream car, that you want that person, the driver to feel, wow, this is my fantasy car? Absolutely. Live your fantasy car or live your fantasy, if you will. Our buyers, you know, love to live beyond the the norm, if you will. They want to be very unique. So what the fantasy car looks like as a kid or when you're playing a video game or you know, what your fantasy car looks like, that's what we create. So yeah, it's living your fantasy and being able to drive the car every day. And user expectations can be really high, right? You know, we have the the simplicity of, you know, products like Apple and, you know, smart homes and we just, our expectations are just, you know, really high. How do you push yourself to just ultimately constantly trying to push the envelope so that you're pushing your own fantasy? Absolutely. The bar is set very high by the billion dollar OEMs and the billion dollar companies who have unlimited resources to produce these things. And, and so we're a much, much smaller boutique company. And we, however, try to stay focused on who we are and what we are and what we can you know, spend our resources on. So that is always a challenge to meet the ever rising consumer expectation. But we do have a huge advantage in the sense that OEMs have to produce mass market cars uh, to appeal to a broad audience. And, you know, they all end up looking the same because they're all produced at a, the same factories, typically, you know, with the same robots and meeting the same regulations, road regulations. So headlights all have to be at the roughly about the same height, taillights, same height. So they end up, you know, a lot of times cars being looking uh, very similar. So we do have some of those requirements, but we can you know, go beyond a little bit. Let's talk about demographics. Who are your buyers? Who buys your cars? So our buyers are, you know, people who have had a lot of other exotic cars. They're very successful people, have a lot of money, and they want something unique that no one else has. They want to stand out and, you know, they just want something cool. And so our tank, our military edition tank with all the gadgets that it has kind of allows them to live that fantasy of being James Bond living, driving a James Bond car that's bulletproof and it has all these cool gadgets like smokescreen and things like that. So it allows them to go beyond themselves, beyond the mortal, mortal real world, if you will. And is that the car that Jamie Foxx drives? Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. You got a lot of celebrities. Chris Brown, Jamie Mm Foxx. I know Jay Leno. There's Jeremiah, another pop singer uh, exhibit as well. So what was the big milestone where you felt that you made it? I think the moment was when we got the first order for the very first beast, you know, and then it became, you know, very real. And then I think the second milestone was, you know, when we started getting 
tank sales, one, two, three, four, five, and, 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 and then we started seeing that volume going up. And then the third milestone, of course, was opening our experience center, our, you know, our showroom here, which was always a dream of mine as well. And you hadn't even built a car yet. The first sell came from the actual design, not from a physical car, right? Yeah, absolutely. To be able to just sell the design off a of design. Well, it was A, obviously having a good design, two, having really photo real renders that someone can imagine, and three, was good media contacts, I think, that we got lucky with, uh, you know, initially. But, but good media contacts that liked what we were doing and, and was able to share it to a large group of people that they were able to see, so... Was this all word of mouth or were you advertising? We didn't actually. We didn't advertise at all. Yeah. We just let the design advertise itself. It was that big push. Yeah. It made it to, in 2014, it made it to the homepage of yahoo.com. And that was like the homepage back then. And so it, it got seen probably by millions of people. So what was it like when you finally saw the finished version? Yeah, I'll never, I'll never forget that moment. It's burned into my memory when I first walked into the you know, the warehouse where the car had been painted and completed. And I first saw it. And I, I remember that moment still. I mean, when I drove it, you know, it was a feeling of beyond, you know, you're over the moon for making this a reality. He's like, when can I afford one? <laughs> when you buy one of your cars, it, you pay for it, a whole thing, cash up front? Or does a deposit or how does that work? Do you finance? Yeah. So it's a cash purchase. There's no financing and it's milestone payments. There's a deposit up front and then there are milestone payments as the build progresses, very much like a custom home, if you will, like you said, and then a final payment upon the completion of the car. And, you know, our cars are typically, although they start at 155000 they can go all the way up to 500000 And the majority of our sales are in the upper price points. They're in the three hundred fifty to 450000 price points. Because when you get in this kind of market, the clientele just, I guess, money is not as as much of an object. So they tend to be fully loaded. So what is your signature medallion or like a signature or something that each car, you know, like one of the things that always fascinated me about the Austin Martins is that on the side, they always had a place that looked like you could put a gun or an umbrella. But there was also always this little mahogany and then later it became metal signatures that you knew it was manufactured and custom, you know, hand built by. Do you have that equivalent, like a hallmark or something in your cars? Yeah. So on the tank, if you look on the sort of the back tailgate area from the side, you'll see three marks, sort of three lines. Those lines are our signature. So our cars will have those going forward. All. How long is the waiting list for one of your cars? Well, you know, we produce about 35 cars a year right now at our current capacity. So I think right now we have about 27 cars in production. It takes about anywhere from 12 weeks to 16 weeks to produce a bespoke car from the ground up. And everything is everything's bespoke. You know, they get to choose their leather and their stitching and their colors and all kinds of requests that we get, and things like that. They really personalize it. Yeah, it's like if you look at mass production cars being like, you know, tract homes or condos, and you look at your cars as being like, you know, custom built luxury home, it's in that same cachet, right? Have you been asked to embellish or create features that were just beyond even your fantasy? And like, whoa, didn't think about that. (laughs) Yeah, here and there. Yeah, we do get requests for various things. Yeah, yeah. And and typically, we're able to make most of them happen. What's the wackiest one you've heard? (laughs) <laughs> well, we've, uh, let's see, uh, can I put a mini gun on top of my roof? You know, can I have a, you know, a bomb detection system that can detect bombs, you know, if somebody puts it on board? We've had, uh, let's see, yeah, just a lot of things like that. A lot of, it gets people's imaginations going. Let's talk about the sports model. And then you have your tank. Totally different customer. I, I'm. I don't know. I mean, is it is it like Hot Wheels? You go. I have to have the my robust SUV, and I need my sports car. Or are they really different buyers that are looking for different experiences? You no, know, they're actually the same buyer. Uh, they are buyers who are looking for something exotic and and cool and different. And so, you know, Lamborghini buyers tend to love our cars a lot. So yeah, it, it's really the same buyers who want something exotic, different, fun. It's a toy. But the tank is. Like, I mean, it really is, like you said, 007, Mad Max, kind of rogue. Uh, it has gas mask. It has, you know, uh, smoke screens and electrification door handles. Can you describe just what was going through your mind of thinking, this is like the pre-COVID 
you know, like Armageddon car. I mean, can what was going through your mind when you when you designed all these features? Nothing else like it. So I think, you know, I was fascinated always with with military jets and transports and things like that. And it was sort of, you know, what is the ultimate James Bond car? You know, what would have all these cool features and gadgets in it that comes from like an Avengers movie or or a James Bond movie? You know, how can we make this real? How cool would it be? Definitely would be fun to have those kinds of things. And I mean, again, they are all meant to be, you know, not that they would be used. They're just meant to be more, um, you know, a novelty item. So let's talk about the whole customization, because I'm really fascinated that you make these beautiful cars and now you have a truck, right? Right. And so I never saw Ford would come out with a, an EV, um, you know, America's favorite truck. They say it's a Ford F-150. Why a truck now? Did you, are you getting demand for a truck or is that another fantasy? Yeah. And that's part of the business lessons you learn in the automotive field is that the SUV market is even better than the sports car market. And so, you know, that was a business decision as well as, a, you know, a cool decision. But the SUV market is a better market. And, you know, it's proven that, you know, it's not our number one seller. And it's practical. Uh, you know, you can pick up the kids from school with it. It's comfortable, but it's also badass. And it makes you have that feeling, you know, when you're driving it. That's really the reason behind it. It was really, you know, military vehicles are often utilitarian. There's no design to them. So the goal behind it, the the vision was to create a futuristic, badass sort of military inspired truck that is designed, that has some professional design to it, some sophistication behind it. That's a little futuristic, almost like a Halo from the video game Halo car. And that's how the vision for that car kind of came about. And the market as well, there's really nothing in the market that was like that. You know, the Hummer was, was that, but, you know, it no longer existed as of, you know, 2008, 2009. So. It opened us up for that. Yeah, you seldom even see a Hummer anymore, right? You see right. them a lot on the side of the road, I would be honest with you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's always needed to be repaired. That's fascinating to me. Yeah, that goes back to sort of, I think we all want to kind of be a little immortal. You know, we love the Avengers movies because of the powers they have. We, we relate to them. We want that Iron Man suit that makes us feel invincible. And our truck gives you that feeling when you're driving it. That you're in, in, you're not in the real world somehow. You're, you're powerful. You're, you're badass. It's unique. My goodness, who doesn't want to feel immortal, right? Yeah. So tell me about Jay Leno. Looking, you know, he's experienced. I think each one of your models now, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we love working with Jay. He loves. They love working with us as well. Yeah, he's. Um, you know, he, he definitely. You know, drove the the Beast several years ago, and he just did a new show with the uh, Hercules that's going to getting released later this summer in a few months as well. So yeah, he's driven all of our cars and he's a, he's a fan. Like many business owners, Ferris was forced to take a serious look at his company once the COVID-19 pandemic hit. He spent the first part of his year, as we all did, terrified about what the future held for both his business and the world. But by the summer of 2020, sales started to pick up again. In such an uncertain world, people still wanted their creature comforts. You know, the first few months, everybody, I think, was trying to get their footing, you know, what's going to happen. But our sales actually increased during COVID. And I think it's because, you know, people couldn't travel, people couldn't do anything, but they could still enjoy their cars. But you actually stopped making the Beast last year, right? Yeah, we actually no longer produce the old Beast. We are actually working on the new version of the Beast. I think the original Beast was great, but it was very visceral and it was very rough for the American market. You know, it didn't have creature comforts. There's a lot of things for it that that made it a very niche car. And the new Beast is going to take all the design experience we've gained, engineering experience we've gained, and the market experience we've gained, and, and really provide a very refined, luxury, yet exotic design car experience. That's going to be extremely fast as well. How fast? <laughs> uh, zero to 60 in about 2.3 you know, seconds, 2.5 seconds fast. Wow. Are going to get Lewis Hamilton to behind the wheel? <laughs> I hope so. Have you been approached or, or would you even consider, you know, an OEM or a fleet, you know, type of a deal? Has anyone ever come to you and said, hey, you know what? I, I need 12 of these. And maybe it's the future of the mail truck, you know, or it's the future of Amazon. Is that something that you would even consider or scale to, or is that just totally against your vision of the company? It is against the vision of the company. However, just with the right partner, absolutely, you know, we would look at it. 
we struggle with that. You know, everybody wants to be big, right? Everybody wants to go public and, you know, get big and rich and grow the company and scale the company. But, you know, we look at that and we're like, you know, we have a great product. Our company is profitable. We love what we do. And is there really a need to try to grow big? What do you really get by growing big? You know, you just get more investors, more personalities, more expectations, you know, the public, uh, you know, if you go public, of course, you're in extreme scrutiny under a lot of scrutiny and you could potentially lose control of your own company. And what really are you gaining at the end of the day, right? It's great for companies who don't have a product to go public or do a SPAC and and so forth, because that's the only way they can make their products. But for us, you know, we have a great product. We love what we do. We're profitable. You know, there's something to say about just staying, staying small, right? So what about an electric vehicle? Is that something you're working on? Yeah, you know, we get that question a lot. Are you going to do EV and so forth? You know, our customers are not the EV type customers. They they love the engine sound. They love the craziness, the uniqueness. The EV market, of course, is largely driven by regulations now. You know, their companies are forced to go EV. And of course, it's, it's a practical, makes a lot of practical sense. But our cars are not about practicality. You know, our cars are about the fantasy, the extreme beyond the ordinary. And from a technology perspective, you know, that ship has sailed, if you will. You know, if we were to start developing our EV platform, I think we would be, you know, 15 years behind everybody else and the resources necessary to do it. So that's why we we focus where we are now. You know, Jeep is releasing their Wrangler electric car, then that will be our electric tank. How will you compete with that? So if somebody does want electric or ultimately when we go into electric, we will use an existing electric platform. Yeah, because California, by 2030, we're supposed to be electric? Yeah, something like that. Of course, I don't think that that's going to happen. Why don't you think that will happen? Too too much compliance? and. Yeah, I just think that the infrastructure needed to support, you know, the electric market production is not going to be fast enough to take that kind of traffic. I think electric cars are something like 2% of the total car sales currently. Much larger in California, of course. You see a lot of Teslas here, but I think it'll be a little longer than that. Well, there's one theory that being sustainable in automotive means just keep the car you have. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Right? And you know that they're, you're familiar with like 3D printing. I was going to question is, you know, is there components, what new approaches are you using in the design of the car that maybe didn't exist when you first started out in designing? So you're doing things with 3D printing, are you doing adding like artificial intelligence or, you know, IoT capabilities? Are there new components to design that didn't exist when you first started? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, definitely we're designing everything on the computer now. We're able to, you know, definitely visualize uh, through renders and 3D, um, you know, software. The design aspect of things a lot better. The engineering of them, you know, the wind tunnel or or suspension or kinematics of how the doors open and close and what are they going to hit? You know, how does a person, you know, get in the car? What's the motion of the person getting into the car? Is it natural? All that stuff we can do on the computer now. And where do you get the idea of like, okay, we need thermal night vision and we need bump detection, like protection. Like I go to the grocery store with my mask on during COVID. I kind of felt like I needed, you know, the tank. But where did that come from? Was that just your fascination with military and going back to planes? Or was that like a request from somebody? No, that was just a, my own personal fascination with James Bond type movies, you know, uh, cool movies and Knight Rider. You know, I used to watch Knight Rider when I was a kid and I met David Hasselhoff. We actually did something with Knight Rider and David Hasselhoff in the tank, which was very, very cool for the History Channel. But yeah, Knight Rider was a big inspiration, you know, having these cool gadgets and features that made you feel almost immortal somehow. But how cool would that be? Right. It was just how cool is that? We get to meet one of your childhood heroes. I mean, that's worth it right there, right? Absolutely. Yeah, that was quite a, that was an amazing experience. Yeah. And to see both cars in the, you know, right next to each other in in the show. So what did you learn over this period of time now that you wish that, that you knew when you started? Would you have quit your day job at IBM? <laughs> no, I think the way I went about it was kind of good. But I think, you know, some of the things that I learned were, some of the aspects of understanding the marketplace, you know, knowing what consumers really want, not always looking at it from my perspective or my point of view, that it's a balance between the two to make it a business, a viable business and loving what you do for a living, you know, comes with that. So I think constantly looking at some of those things, the practical aspects of things, you know, one of the best decisions I made at the time was 
people often ask me, why did you name the company after your last name? And it's, you know, now that I've experienced building the company to where it is, you know, I've realized that when you have your last name on the company, you will never let it fail because it is part of you and you will work, you will make sure that it's successful. And I really experienced that firsthand. You know, if it was just a throwaway name that, you know, oh, it didn't, it's too hard. Let's just throw it away and, and go back. But when it's you, your name is on it. You, you make sure it's successful. So are there mistakes that you've seen other companies that try to get into automotive design and create cars? I'm sure you kind of watch to see what other people have done because there's been a lot, particularly in the electric car market, there's been a lot of fails, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. There's, you know, it's a very expensive, you know, after aerospace, it's the most expensive industry to be in. So, so yeah, it requires a tremendous amount of capital if you want to do it. And we've been able to do it in a way creatively that doesn't require as much capital. Wow. So what does the future hold for Rizvani Motors? Well, I think we have established ourselves in that niche market. I think the future for us is continuing doing what we do best, which is really cool, exotic designer cars and, you know, continuing to go down that route and slowly increasing our volume and going more mass market with some models. So we have some models, for example, the tank and other things that are sort of our bread and butter. They keep the company healthy. And then we have our cool cars that we all love to do. That was Ferris Rezvani of Rezvani Motors. He told me that while he loves all the cars his company makes, his favorite vehicle is the original beast. But remember his father, the Air Force pilot? He was a tougher sell. Ferris says it took his father a while to buy into the idea of quitting his job to build souped up tactical luxury vehicles. Once Rezvani Motors took off, he changed his mind and is now very proud of his son. But after years of traveling faster than the speed of sound, Ferris says his father has no interest in owning a beast or a tank. He's happier in his Honda CRV. Before It Happened is produced by me, Donna Laughlin, along with Studio Pod Media. The executive producer is Katie Sunku Wood. And all episodes are written and developed by Jack Buer. Our show coordinator is Deanna Morency, with additional editing and music provided by Noda Lab.